Welcome, everybody. We are so pleased that you've joined us at this Garrison Institute Pathways to Planetary Health Forum. I'm Jonathan Rose, and I am the co-founder of the Garrison Institute. Before we begin today's discussion, let's review a few of the logistical items um, for our gathering. This is a Zoom webinar, so participant audio, which means your audio, is off, and your video too. Please direct any questions to the Q&A box below, and I will monitor it, and we'll get to as many questions as we can towards the end of the conversation. We're also recording these conversations, so you'll have a chance to view the recordings as well as a schedule of upcoming programs at garrisoninstitute.org. And also we have an amazing list of our past conversations. This is an interactive online event. It's part of our Pathways to Planetary Health Forum 2022 series. It's actually the last one of 2022, which explores the topic of regeneration across four pathways. Half Earth, which is the preservation of biodiversity, which is what we're talking about today, ecological civilization, regenerative economics, and the common good. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our guest today, Keith Nero. Keith is the Senior Program Officer in charge of global conservation at the Weiss Foundation. He oversees all the Foundation's conservation grant making, including the Weiss Campaign for Nature, a $1.5 billion global effort launched October 2018 to help protect 30% of the world's land and oceans by 2030, and we're going to talk some more about it. The Weiss Foundation's conservation focus includes land and ocean protected areas created in, and their creation and management in Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean, Central America, South America, East African countries, Romania, Spain, Georgia, Australia, and of course, in the United States too. Before joining the Weiss Foundation, uh, Heath handed, uh, served as a combat engineer in the 4th Infantry Division, serving as a one-year combat tour in the first year of the War of Iraq. Um, earning a Bronze Star for his service. Um, after his, leaving the Army, he worked for the Wilderness Society, helping local advocates secure administrative protections for at-risk wildlands through the use of land use planning processes. He holds a, a BS in Civil Engineering from the US uh, Military Academy at West Point. West Point is literally across the river from Garrison Institute. Some people call us the East Point. And he has a Master's in Environmental Policy from the University of Michigan. Keith, welcome to the show. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure so to be here. let's talk about your journey. How you, where'd you grow up? So I grew up in a small town in West Central Wisconsin called Menominee, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> my parents were both college professors. And as such, we had the summers off and we were able to travel all around the country, going to our national parks. Um, that was our my parents' big thing was to put myself and my sister, um, Heather, into the, a big brown van we called Brownie and drive west and go to Yellowstone, and Grand Tetons and, you know, Grand Canyon, Yosemite, you name it, we, we went to it as a kid. Hmm. But if I remember Menominee, wasn't there a big paper plant there? Wasn't that a center of paper manufacturing? Um, the big industry there now is glass making and agriculture, but there's also a, um, a dairy plant there. There's a lot of dairy, obviously, in, in that part of Wisconsin as well. Got it. Got it. And then what inspired you to go to West Point? Um, <laughs> so I always wanted to serve. That was something that was very important to me. But um, Army West Point was also the only Division One hockey program that contacted me and gave me an opportunity to play. Right. Um, so as an 18 year old in 1996, I thought what could possibly go wrong with this decision and um, free school, a chance to play hockey. And that's that's kind of how I ended up at West Point. And it is a great school. I mean, it's a great engineering school and has a, um, so um, uh, then you served uh, and we are very grateful for your service. And then you ended up uh, at uh, the Wilderness Society. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> my last year in the army, so when you go to West Point, you incur a five year um, mandatory obligation of service. Um, so I got back from Iraq in uh, April, of, or sorry, March of 2004, still had about a year left on my commitment, I graduated in 2000. Um, and so I knew I wanted to do something in conservation. And so I was granted a transfer to be the officer in charge of the Directorate of Environmental Compliance and Management 
at Fort Carson mm -hmm. in Colorado Springs. So I did that. And, and while there, I um, helped develop the sustainability program that's still in use um, to this day. And um, one of the projects I got to work on was protecting land along the southern boundary of the, of the military installation to protect it from encroaching residential development, which would, of course, harm the ability to use it to, for training. Um, so that kind of was interesting to me, and I was very interested in land conservation. And when I got out, I threw out a bunch of resumes. And luckily, um, a woman named Maida Culver, who now works at the Interior Department, saw my resume. Um, she had worked with the military in a civilian capacity. She's probably the only person that would have seen my resume and call, called me in for an interview. And um, luckily, I, I got it. And um, I spent two years traveling around the West, um, helping local advocates figure out the Byzantine Bureau of Land Management's land use um, planning process to advocate for the protection, the administrative protection, the sort of temporary protection of lands that we thought had wilderness characteristics. Um, the plans that we worked on ended up protecting about 600,000 acres, which was mm. uh, pretty gratifying. Yes, and that, by the way, we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about buying land to preserve it and buying conservation easements, but actually, regulatory protection is also really important. Uh, actually, yeah. I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump into that, which is that um, but you work in many parts of the world. And in some places, regulations don't work so well, because they don't have such good regulatory controls. Yeah. Um, so here at the Weiss Foundation, so I came to the Weiss Foundation after going to the University of Michigan after um, graduate school, we're really focused on permanent protections. And what does that mean? That means there's some legal, legally enforceable restriction on what can happen with that land moving forward. That can be private land that's put into conservation easements like we have here in the United States, where that the restrictions run with the title of the land and the next landowner, 10 landowners in the future cannot mess up the land. They can't, they can't do certain things with it. Um, may, might be national parks um, in places like Argentina. Um, places, you know, some of the countries that we're working in Africa. Um, so there's, you know, there's different tools, but for us, we only sort of count the acres, if you will, if there is a legally enforceable restriction on what can happen with that land moving forward. Got it. Um, and so sometimes that's actually owning the land, sometimes it's, bought, it's paying for a permanent restriction. That's right. And uh, we use a, a, a bunch of different tools. Um, obviously, the the, the, the strongest and best protection, generally speaking, around the world is a national park because it has mm -hmm. to go through a political process. And to be undesignated, it would have to go through that same political process. Um, but yeah, in some cases, um, it does make the most sense. And Belize is a great example where we funded the acquisition of land in a corridor between two massive forests, where unfortunately, due to agricultural um, incursions, the the ability of animals to move from one large uh, portion of protected forest to another um, had to go through private land. And then in that case, it made the most sense. And, and I have an example of that um, in the slides later. Um, we, you know, that land is now held in trust. It's private land, but it's held in trust on for the benefit of the people of Belize. And so how did you have, take down fences or how did you make that corridor work? So fortunately, that corridor is in really good shape. It's sort of the last of what was left. And so we had to help uh, rewild, <clears throat> excuse me, rewild our partner, purchase the land, and then negotiate the trust with the government of Belize. Um, fortunately, we didn't have to do a lot of rewilding in that case. It was still pretty wild. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing. Uh, CNN recently did a, a big special on the Belize Forest Corridor and how important it is. Um, so folks can look that up. Hmm. This is uh, actually, uh, Monique continues to put little notes in the chat. And um, uh, if you would give Monique a hint as to where she can find it, and she'll stick it in the chat so people can find it. Right. Yeah, it was just, just uh, if you, I think if you Google CNN Belize Forest Corridor, you you'd probably find it. Okay, great. So uh, this is actually a really important point, which is that um, species need for species density and species diversity they need a certain size of land and and we actually need so preserving land is important but preserving the connections between 
parcels is also really important. So how do you prioritize that? How do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, so we we sort of have a, generally speaking, a minimum acreage size that we, for projects that we invest in of about 100,000 acres. Um, much now the, the Belize Forest Corridor is a good example of one that's an exception to that. It's only about 50,000 acres, but it's a very critical 50,000 acres. When it comes to all prioritization for us, I think one of the things that makes us unique is that we really focus on the political feasibility of a project mm -hmm. as much, if not more, than the environmental benefits because you can spend, we could spend our entire endowment working in a place that, um, as you said, you know, may not have the right rules, regulations, doesn't have the political support. It's not going to happen. We feel our money would be better used, even if it's a little bit lower biodiversity value on an area that can actually get protected and we can guarantee that it's going to be protected in perpetuity. Right. You know, I got involved in this part of the, this kind of work um, with the Rainforest Foundation, which was founded by Sting and his wife, Trudy Styler, mm -hmm. um, 1980s. They were working in Brazil and the politics kept changing. So, you know, we would have great political support and then we'd have great political non-support. And we've all, we've seen that continue to in Brazil to this day. Sure. Um, yeah. uh, so that's a very important, uh, very important criteria. Let's show some projects so that people uh, who are watching have some sense of what these look like. Monique, can you bring them up or Dawn? True, great. All right. So this is just our um, our mission statement. Um, we have two sides of the foundation. I run the conservation side, and we also have a social justice side. So this is trying to just encapsulate um, the entirety of, of, of our mission. Um, next slide, please. So this is the guy who makes it all possible. This is Hans Jörg Wies. Um, he founded the Wies Foundation in 1998. Um, he made uh, his money in with a company called Synthes um, that he sold to Johnson and Johnson in 2012. Um, you know, he's sort of our he, he sets the priorities for the foundation and land protection has always land and ocean protection have always been huge priorities of his. He um, interestingly enough, he's like I said, he's Swiss, but he was uh, went to Harvard for business school. And in one of his summers, he took an internship with the Colorado Highway Department. Um, not far from where I, I live here in Durango, and was out surveying a, a, <laughs> a, new, a new highway and couldn't believe that all the land around him was publicly accessible, it was public land. He could go wherever he wanted, didn't have to pay trespass fees. And as a young man in like 1956 or something like that, 58, he said, I'm going to, if I ever make a bunch of money, I'm going to set up a foundation and help to protect this kind of landscape. So um, that's, that's uh, Hans Jörg. Um, next slide, please. And um, to show, and, and Jonathan mentioned this in the, in the very beginning, to show how um, important he sees biodiversity conservation and protected areas creation. Um, back in 2018, he launched the Wies Campaign for Nature, which at the time was a 10 year, $1 billion commitment to nature. Um, in 2021, we joined the Protect Our Planet Coalition and he increased his giving to another 500 million and extended it out to 2030. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is, this is our map of our focal regions um, showing where most of our projects are. Um, we do have a little, little bit of latitude to work outside of um, these areas. Um, uh, we have one project in Chile, for instance, um, and we, we're always looking for, for, for new areas to expand to. Um, the blue stars are where we currently have marine protected area projects. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to give a couple examples of projects. So um, this first, very first picture here is Catmuck, which is also known, you may know better as Jumbo, um, Jumbo Glacier or Jumbo Wild. Um, Patagonia um, made this a, a very big priority for theirs. There's a great film, Jumbo Wild, that you can see. Um, what was going to happen here is on the glacier, there was a guy from Italy who was going to set up a European style, massive, like 15,000 acre development ski resort. Um, the locals didn't want it. The uh, Katana First Nation didn't want it. 
And so um, we worked with a bunch of other funders and on the ground uh, NGOs and the indigenous community there to buy out that lease, that recreation lease on that land. And um, the British Columbia government is in the process of designating a much larger area around that 15,000 acres as a co-managed protected area. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a place I just had the, uh, the, the honor of going um, just uh, back in September. Um, this is Georgia, the country. <laughs> um, obviously not Georgia, <laughs> not Atlanta, Georgia. Um, so this is a spectacular landscape. Um, there's really five sort of landscapes within the country, three in the um, greater Caucasus and two in the lesser Caucasus that we're working with um, Caucasus Nature Fund, uh, our local NGO partner there to protect. And the idea here is they have public land, just, just like we do here, Bureau, consider it sort of similar to Bureau of Land Management or Forest Service land, and they wanna create national parks. Well, they need money in order to do that, that there's costs with infrastructure, tourism development, and also local communities wanna see benefits. So what we've done is uh, pledged almost $10 million, about $9.5 million to um, help with that initial infrastructure, that initial tourism development contingent on the areas being protected. So they, no, no money flows unless the area is protected by the government. And Caucasus Nature Fund is um, matching us 50 cents on the dollar for funding that will go towards local economic development outside of the, of the parks. So we'll pay for initial uh, rangers, we'll pay for guard stations, we'll pay for the trucks that they need, um, signage for trails, building of trails, we'll pay for that, but it doesn't, none of the money gets paid unless the areas are protected. It gets paid out on a per acre basis to incentivize the government to make them as large as possible. Um, next slide, please. So here's the, the Maya, Sport, Maya Forest Corridor. Um, I saw Don put a, a link in the, in the chat box there. Um, so this is that area that we were talking about that um, there's not really public land in Belize. And so the best way to protect land is to have it be remain privately owned, but then have it be held in trust on behalf of the people of Belize. Um, so these lands um, will be publicly accessible subject to the management plan of the private landowner, which is a, a locally chartered Belizean trust. Um, this, in this case, um, we, we originally put $900,000 into um, an initial purchase that was $21 million total. Um, we have since in, uh, increased our investment and uh, pledged additional funding, hope to close on the first couple of properties to expand this corridor to make sure it's functioning in perpetuity and never unbroken. Um, and we've, we decided to put in some additional funding and that ho hopefully the first two of those properties, there's like five or six of them, um, will be purchased by the end of this calendar year. Um, next slide, please. So um, while we've been talking a lot about protected area creation, I also wanted to make sure we touched on some of the work we're doing in Africa, which as opposed to um, new protected areas creation, it's really about shoring up the management of existing protected areas. So it's providing resources to um, have guards, to have um, tourism infrastructure, um, to make sure that there's resources there to handle all the threats that these existing protected areas face. Um, so this particular one is Ghana Rizzo in Zimbabwe. Um, we have pledged to provide a million dollars a year for five years to the Frankfurt Zoological Society who manages the park on the behalf of the Zimbabwean government. We're gonna do that for five years. And then an organization called Legacy Landscapes Fund that was chartered by the um, German Development Authority will take over the next 10 years for a million dollars per year. So it's a good way that we don't get caught having to fund an area in perpetuity, but have the confidence that at least for the next 15 years, this, this park is gonna have the resources it needs to deal with all the challenges that it's facing. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> this is a really exciting project. Um, this is a Deje um, Decho uh, Protected Area National Wildlife Area. So this is in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Um, massive um, peat bogs, wetlands, very, very important from a climate perspective. 
probably wouldn't choose it as the number one most biodiverse place in the world, um, because as you go higher in latitude, as everyone knows, um, there's less and less biodiversity. But the biodiversity that is there is, is still in pretty good shape. It's, this is like, um, I always give this sort of analogy. And um, <clears throat> you probably, you know, you remember the parable of the old man who's walking down the, uh, the ocean and the tide is out and he sees the little kid and the sun's out and the, he, he sees a kid picking up and throwing something into the ocean. And he goes up to the child and says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm throwing in the starfish so that they can survive. We have to do that. And he says, well, that's ridiculous. There's miles and miles of beaches. You can't possibly save them all. And the kid says, yeah, but it mattered to that one as he throws one in. And this is that kind of a project where it maybe not is not the most biodiverse place. But what we did with this project was protect three and a half million acres, provided resources to the local um, Decho First Nation so that they're now co-managing this part of their traditional homeland and they have the resources necessary to do that. It's really buying time until Canada comes in with significantly more money. Um, this is also going to eventually, hopefully be knock on wood, be covered in what's called a project finance for permanence, which is a huge fund that brings in private philanthropy, government um, together to fund the long-term protection of these of this area and many, many others around the entire Northwest Territories of Canada. Um, next slide. So this is one of my favorite um, <laughs> projects. Um, and I know I have some of our, our grantees from Argentina are, um, are on. And so hopefully my saying that this is one of my favorite projects doesn't mean that I don't love the other projects that we had up in, in, in Argentina as well. But this is a place called Pajunia um, Provincial Reserve. And it's an existing um, about 1.3 million acre reserve. The problem is about 70% of the land within it is privately owned, meaning the government can't stop a lot of the bad things that are happening, whether that be hunting, um, mining, what, what have you. And so what we're doing is coming in and purchasing the land, donating it to the provincial government, and the agreement is that the provincial government will then upgrade its management to a provincial park, which is an IUCN category two, meaning all of those bad uses cannot happen in these lands. It's all by willing sellers. We're not compelling anyone to sell. It's not being um, you know, expropriated or anything like that. It's, it's willing sellers. If you, want, if you want to sell your land, we're gonna help buy it. Um, if, if not, you can remain a private landowner within the reserve. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> I also, <clears throat> excuse me, wanted to cover some of our um, marine protected areas work. So this is the now the largest um, protected area, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, the Atlantic and the fourth largest marine protected area in the world in Tristan da Cunha. Tristan da Cunha is a UK overseas territory and it has sort of semi-autonomous uh, rights within that. And the government of Tristan da Cunha said, we want to protect the marine area around our island. That's what's important to us. What they, you know, wasn't, wasn't forced on them by the UK government at all. They just, they said, we want to do that. And so what we did is provide a um, uh, money that was contingent on, the, again, the area being protected. And now we're paying for the management plan, along with other funders, but we're paying for the management plan and getting the management of the area up and running. Uh, next slide. And this is the last one. Um, and this one I wanted to, to show just some of the challenges that remain even when you get an area protected. So um, this is the Moonga Theory Simpson Desert National Park in South Australia, the, the state of South Australia. In Australia, the national parks are created and managed by the states. The federal government has sort of a minimum standard you have to reach but the states control their, the, the public, the crown land within, within their state. So this was an area that was made up of a couple of different existing reserves that were very low levels of protection. And the South Australia government <clears throat> wanted to upgrade that protection level. So we, this, in this case, we just funded the advocacy. We funded the Wilderness Society of South Australia to advocate for this area's protection. It was upgraded. It's now the largest national park in Australia. Unfortunately, it's underlain with a bunch of existing oil and gas leases. They haven't been developed, but those rights still exist. 
And so now we're um, helping the, the, um, the Wilderness, Astro Wilderness Society of South Australia, which is no, um, there's no uh, connection between our, our uh, Wilderness Society here in the States. Um, but we're helping them raise awareness about the fact that this area is still threatened and that these oil and gas leases have got to go away. Um, so hopefully that provided some, you know, tangible uh, examples of, of, of the kind of work that we, we fund and what we do. It's amazing work. So um, thanks, Don. You can end the slides. What amazing work. It's so beautiful to see those, the, the variety of life around the earth and how beautiful it is and now how precious it is because of uh, human activity. Um, there is a global movement rising to protect it. Um, so let's talk about the 2030 goals. So explain to our audience, what are the 2030 goals and are we going to get there? Great. Well, the timing of this conversation is great because tonight, the um, 15th uh, Conference of the Parties to the Convention on Biological Diversity kicks off in Montreal. And that's where the, the world sets targets for many things that have, that have to do with um, that have to do with uh, biodiversity conservation from everything from um, how to make supply chains better and more eco ecologically friendly um, to how we share benefits um, for medicines, let's say that are that are taken out of the Amazon rainforest. How do we how do we ensure that Brazil and Ecuador and um, Peru get credit, some sort of payment for for those kinds of services that their intact ecosystems are are um, providing. Our biggest push and, and why Hans York launched the Weiss Campaign for Nature back in 2018 is one of the targets is how much of the earth should be protected. Um, there are, there's a big movement um, that was E.O. Wilson, who I'm sure everyone listening has heard of. Um, he thought we should do 50% of the planet by 50-50. We don't disagree, but in order to get to 50, you've got to go through 30. And 30, 2030 is before 2050. So and right now we're at about 16.6% uh, of land and about 7.7% of the ocean. So in the existing targets for 17% for land and 10% for oceans. So what our goal is to get the world to agree to protecting 30% of the oceans and 30% of the land by 2030. At this, it, hopefully by the end of the next two weeks, that will have been adopted. Now, people I think have understandable skepticism of, well, that's just a UN target, what does it matter? Well, I can tell you in my conversations with environment ministers, with heads of state in the countries we're working in, they're very well aware of what they've committed to. Um, when we talked with um, the former president of Argentina, um, Mauricio Macri, he would ask, well, how, how is this uh, park that you guys want to create, how's that going to, what's the percentage of, of Argentina that that's going to cover? Um, and we hear that all the time. So there is sort of a pressure that the targets themselves um, create. How are we going to get there? Well, the reality is we're still going to have to do area by area by area, but there are ways of scaling up that work. I mentioned the project finance for permanence. I think that has probably the best, um, that's the best opportunity we have to really scale up conservation. And so what a project finance for permanence fund is, is you take a geographic area that can be an entire country, it could be a province, it could be a state, it could be a county, whatever it is, and the county says, okay, we would like to protect 30% of our, of our state or, or what have you. Um, but that, that's gonna cost money, right? We're gonna have to, um, we're gonna have to pay for guards. We're gonna have to pay for infrastructure. We're gonna have to pay for all these things. How do we do that? So what um, we're doing is in multiple locations around the globe, um, coming together with bringing philanthropic dollars, private philanthropy, and government together to set up funds that will pay for that management so that the, the municipality or the state or the province has the um, confidence that they're, it's not going to be a net cost to them, that there's going to be funding there to implement the protections that, they're, that they legally um, undertake. Now, when you say project finance, normally I think of like a loan to build a subway system or a bridge or or a new you know, power plant that then has income that pays that finance back. So how does that work? 
So um, we're still encouraging, um, you know, any fees that are that are um, raised, any revenue that comes off of the conservation to be used by the government. But we're under we we recognize the fact that oftentimes conservation does not fully pay for itself because we're not because of we don't internalize externalities, right? So you set up a huge, a massive new park. It's going to protect water. It's going to protect air. It's going to make people healthier because they're going to have places to recreate. We can't, there's no go really good way to internalize the fact that those, those benefits are flowing from that protected area. Now, if we could ever come up with a way of doing that, that would be like eco ecosystem services, that kind of thing, um, that would be great. But in the interim, in order to scale up to meet the, the, the threats that we actually have to biodiversity, um, we think that this project finance for permanence, which is, it's, it's philanthropy, but it's also government coming in, mm -hmm. um, that's probably the best model um, to move forward quickly. Interesting. You know, it really raises an interesting thing about uh, the discontinuity between two systems. So nature is real. I mean, nature, you know, is... Nature is real. And the economy, which we think is real, is actually completely a mental construct. It's we completely invented it. Why a dollar is more, more than a yen is big or whatever, because it's we just decided it to be that way. We've assigned these arbitrary values, and uh it has all our fears and aspirations projected into it. Um and so we're taking this abstract mental construct of which, by the way, our entire civilization is now based upon, which is an economy. And then we're trying to layer over it and have nature, which is the source of life from which we all come and is the foundation of all of life. And, you know, I am seeing where we're asking nature to pay us for the fact that we have this economic construct, whereas nature is real and the economic construct isn't. And, um, uh, and that's putting a lot of pressure on nature. So what I love about what you just described is that it's not asking nature itself to be an economy. It's actually, right. It's actually it's asking, recognizing the real challenges that um, countries in the developing world have. Um, where if you look at where most of the biodiversity is, um, you know, it's not in Canada and the United States and Northern Europe. Um, it is in Africa, it is in um, Southeast Asia, it is in, you know, countries that don't have lots of money, and asking them to forego development in order for the entire world to be able to save biodiversity and, in the bio, in, you know, of course, saving areas also has a huge climate impact, a very positive climate impact. Um, it's recognizing that they need to, offsets for what they're, what they're choosing not to exploit. Right. So uh, I've actually heard that 87% of um, biodiversity takes place or is, is on indigenous lands. Now, one of the reasons is, you know, New York, the New York Harbor used to be an astoundingly biodiverse place. And it's, it's not now because we because there's no longer an indigenous land. Um, it's New York City. So, um, uh, but it's clear that the livelihoods and the well-being of indigenous peoples is really critical to the preservation of that biodiversity. And you mentioned in several of the cases that you were working on, you were working with indigenous people. So talk to us more about that and, and not only what you're doing, but what you think should be done. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's absolutely critical um, that local communities support conservation. Without that, it, it just doesn't work. Um, you know, if you're, if you have sort of fortress conservation where you're excluding locals from deriving benefits from it, it's never going to work. There, there, there's going to be incursions into it for poaching, for agriculture, what, what have you. Um, I think a lot of countries are recognizing now that um, nature is a pathway through which reconciliation can be achieved. It's not the silver bullet. It's not the only thing that needs to be done. But in Canada, in Australia in particular, where, um, where, I, where I, I've, I have personal experience, um, we're seeing that rather than using the social safety net, the conservation of a park can provide jobs, it can provide meaning, it can provide um, you know, a, a re-identification of cultural values that may have been lost because of, of being severed from the land. 
And so it is, it is really serving both a social need and an environmental need. I think that's a beautiful idea. Uh, Charity Landon asks, um, can you provide money directly to indigenous uh, governments themselves, the tribes? So because of US charitable law, it's very difficult. Um, you have to essentially prove that you're the equivalent of a 501c3, um, IRS 501c3. And so giving to governments directly is actually very difficult. We can um, provide funding to a, to a public charity who then uses that funding um, locally to, to fund government um, activities and to pay for rangers and that kind of thing. But yeah, there's, there's limitations of what can be done because of, of charitable U.S. charitable law and we're a U.S. charity. But what about funding in Canada or Australia? Can so Canada and Australia is easier. We have um, we have tax treaties with both. Well, this is getting really in the weeds. Um, tax treaties with both of those countries that makes it easier to do. Um, generally speaking, we we still prefer to run it through a, a local NGO. Um, that is, but that, that but a lot of those those actual benefits do flow directly to the to the indigenous um, governments or the indigenous people themselves. Right. So another question is just to clarify: Did you say project finance for permanence? Yeah, PFPs is the is the acronym. Great. It's a fantastic uh, idea. Are um are do you, do you know of other cases or other uh, organizations that are using this? Yeah. So um, there's an organization, a sort of a coalition, I guess, a loose organization a coalition called Enduring Earth. And it um, Pew is part of it, Pew Charitable Trust, the Nature Conservancy is part of it, um, Zoma Labs is part of it. I'm, I know I'm going to miss some. Um, uh, WWF, uh, World Wildlife Fund is part of it. And so they're in the process of working with governments all around the world to try to, to figure out um, how, to, how to structure these. Each PFP is very unique. Um, and you have to also bring together different funders and different funders have different priorities. So some funders may be very interested in economic development in local communities. We're very interested in protected areas creation and then ensuring that the resources are there for ongoing management. So they have to balance all of those things. It's kind of like keeping the plate spinning, you know, but when, when it comes together, um, there's a couple of examples. So the first one um, was in British Columbia, um, the Great Bear or Rainforest. Um, that was sort of a, an early iteration of a PFP that relied far more on private philanthropy than public finance. Um, Herencia Colombia is an uh, example uh, in Colombia that provides resources for um, ongoing management of the existing protected areas network. Um, we provided some funding of that through the Andes Amazon Fund, um, but also uh, I believe the Norwegian government put in a significant amount of money. Um, and so there's a couple of examples of where it's been done on a, on a kind of smaller scale. And what we're trying to do is really scale that up. Right. You know, one of the um, ways that we've used in America to, ex to not have to pay for the whole parcel of land is to do a conservation easement or uh, sometimes conservation servitudes or uh, covenants. Um, are you seeing that uh, spreading throughout the, you and I were involved in a project in Canada that actually had some little resistance to conservation easements. So uh, how's that idea uh, spreading? I would say it's a mixed bag. Um, I was just in Chile in October, the end of October, and they just passed a law that actually allows for conservation easements. Um, I think what they're experiencing is what we experienced here 50 years ago when um, what's an easement? And some, some easements were very unprotective, like didn't really do much. And then others were very strict. And how do you count that towards you know, your air, the protected areas network? Um, so I think they're, they're still figuring that out, but that's an example of a country who just recently, uh, just last year, passed that law. Um, so I, in, in um, Australia, they, they use covenants um, that are held by the state. Um, we did that on a project that was an indigenous land back um, uh, um, project in New South Wales called um, Nimikaira. And um, that and Gaini is actually the is the indigenous word for it. 
um, that, you know, so I have seen it, it happen a few places, um, but there is resistance to it some places and some, in some countries, it's almost anathema to the understanding of private property that why would a private mm. property owner ever limit his or her ability to exploit that land that they own. Um, so it's been a bit of a mixed bag. It's, it's definitely not spreading as quickly or as far as I would wish it was. Right. You know, it's interesting. Uh, the Garrison Institute has a program on what we call the common good. And we're very concerned, actually, that the more, you know, so indigenous lands originally were owned in the commons. The, obviously, the air is the commons. And I actually think of life as the commons, the the the. the the genome, the metagenome of all life of Earth is really a, a commons. And we bring walls around it when we privatize it. Sometimes we actually build those fences, which as we described earlier, cuts off the flow of nature and fragments, uh, eco ecologies. Um, are you seeing alternative forms of ownership? Being, so we've kind of described as well, there's public ownership, there's kind of land trust ownership, and there's, um, uh, private property ownership. Is there anything in between that you think would be a useful tool or that works? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, so the Andes Amazon Fund, who works in sort of the northern um, northern South America, um, they're doing a lot of indigenous titling. So taking mm -hmm. that common and actually ensuring that uh, indigenous people have legal title to their land so that they can stop mining road building, right. forestry, et cetera. You know, that's sort of one, that's one way to, to go with that. Um, that. That really puts it more towards a private property. It's held in common by the indigenous government, right. but it's but it's private land, if that makes sense. Right. I mean, sort of taking it out of the public domain and, and, and privatizing it. Um, we've done some land back, uh, projects here in the United States, one that we've finished and one, and one that's still in process. Um, and what we've done is purchased private timberlands, transferred it to um, an indigenous government. Right. In the case I'm thinking of is the Yurok, um, the Blue Creek Yurok Salmon Sanctuary. So this was existing timberland that was owned by Green Diamond Timber, I believe. Um, we purchased it through uh, an organization or with an organization and, and, a, and a whole bunch of funding sources. It was actually crazy how all the funding came together. But that land is now being transferred to um, the Yurok for long-term management. But you run into a little bit of a catch-22 here. If you hand over land to a sovereign nation, which the Yurok right. are, they're a federally recognized tribe, in theory, they could do whatever they want. Right. And so because they're a sovereign, they're, they have sovereignty. Right. So what we agreed to, what we negotiated out with the Yurok was a limited waiver of sovereign immunity, meaning that a conservation easement could be placed over that land, handed to them, and if they ever violate it, that, that they can be sued in, in state right. court to, in, to get in it, um, to you know, stop that, the, the use from happening. And, and I think that's a good model um, for here in the United States where you have good rule of law or relatively good rule of law. Right. Uh, well, it's rule of law, but yes, yeah. <laughs> for property rights anyway. Um, and, you know, I think there's, cause there's a real movement to, to give land back and that's, and we're all for that, but we're a conservation funder. We need to ensure that there's going to be a conservation mandate on that land that's enforceable in perpetuity. Um, if we're going to be involved in land back type transactions. And so I think that's a really good model um, when we talk about land going back to the rightful owners, the indigenous people. I also love the way you said that this was a, a really a great pathway for reconciliation. Mm -hmm. uh, are you seeing other major philanthropists doing this too? Yeah, I mean, I think um, there's, a, I think all of the all the major funders in this space, whether it's Bezos or um, Patagonia, um, you know, obviously seen they just recently, um, the way that Yvonne Chouinard um, uh, sold off his company and, and, you know, that they're very focused on indigenous conservation as well. Um, in Canada, I think they're light years ahead of us, um, largely because they had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, that identified conservation as one of the pathways towards reconciliation. Um, 
And so I think, I think most funders in this space are, are very interested in the in ensuring that conservation results in benefits to people as well, indigenous people, local people, um, that it's not just you set aside an area and and, and hope for the best, um, that it that it is tied to the community. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so uh, another question. Uh, so what are some of the next projects to accomplish your uh, 30 by 30 campaign goals? So I'm going to break that into two. So what are the projects on the ground to achieve the goals? I'm going to break it into three. What are some of the projects in the politics to achieve the goals? And what are the projects in the money to achieve the goals? All good questions. So um, a depressing statistic I just uh, recently calculated. So we so Hans Jörg Wiesner's philanthropy has protected about 85 and a half million acres since he launched us in 1998. That's amazing. Um, we're on a clip of about 12 to 15 million acres per year that, that our projects are now protecting. Um, we have about 60 projects that are currently active, and some of those projects have multiple land or seascapes. Um, we've also helped to protect about 3 million square kilometers of, um, of ocean. And we have projects in the pipeline that would probably protect another 1 million uh, square kilometers. So we have a lot of things already in the pipeline, but even if, so when we reach 100 million acres of protection, which hopefully will happen sometime next year in the life of, of the life of the, over the life of the foundation, that's two tenths of 1% of the surface of the earth. So, <laughs> We have in you know the last basically whatever 24 years, we, we will have protected two tenths of one percent. To get to 30 percent, that's hard. Um, and that's why we have to scale up. We, when we look at the um the uh, PFP that I was talking about in the Northwest Territories that the Decho um would that that Adeje would be part of, we're hoping for somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million acres just out of that one project. So I think we have to scale up. On the other hand, you can't forget about some of the smaller areas that have high biodiversity that need to be protected. And if you just think about it as an acreage standpoint, you're going to miss some good opportunities. So as far as um, the money goes, I'll answer that one first. I think the PFPs offer the best way to bring as much money to bear to get as many areas protected as quickly as possible. And that's what we need to do. At the end of the day, we need to protect as many places as quickly as possible and make them as large, wild, and biodiverse as we possibly can. Um, I don't know if that really answers your answers your question, but um, I mean we have we have plenty of things in the pipeline. Um, you know, Hans Jörg pledged one and a half billion dollars by 2030. We've either spent or have already approved projects up to 775 million dollars. So we're, you know, <laughs> over halfway, halfway there. Um, you know, I think we will continue to, to work with our partners all around the world. I mean, you know, I think we all hope that we can expand beyond the geographies that, that were shown in that map to, to work in a few um, places where it's going to be a little harder, um, where we're going to have to be a little bit more patient, um, where the, the rule of law isn't as uh, ironclad as most of the places that we're working. Um, but you know, we have to have an entrepreneurial, and I think not just us, that's not just the Wies Foundation. I think all of philanthropy has to have a little bit more of an entrepreneurial spirit and really take some more risks and start working in places that are that are a little harder to work in. So speaking about places a little easier to work, one of the questions is, um, would you accept an application from a not-for-profit land trust in Connecticut? Sure, we're always we're always um, willing to, to to have a conversation. I mean, we like I said, we generally work at a pretty big scale, and Connecticut might be tough, but we have a, actually have a, pr a project um, that's at Open Space Institute that Ooh, is um, designed specifically to work in the east on um, trying to protect wildlands. If you look at a map of biodiversity in the United States, you'll notice it's mostly on the east coast and along the Appalachians, um, and then some in uh, California. Um, so yeah, we're we're um, we're always always interested to hear from folks. No so problem. What, somebody, what does somebody do? Do they write through your email, or how should they? Reach out? Um, yeah, the probably the best thing to do is um, yeah, just uh, you can put my email in the in the chat. That's fine, um, and uh, I'll direct it to the the proper person here. 
Great. We are and by another I mean, person. To be fair, we are by invitation only, but we are always looking for good projects, and it's a two-way right. street for sure. Right. And we don't have like other, an open application process, unfortunately. And somebody else is saying, uh, "What are you doing in Madagascar?" So we don't currently have a project there. We're we're looking at one with um, WCS that looks pretty interesting, but we have don't have any. We do not have an approved that uh, when the those those regions are areas that the board told us we can work in. Right. That, that's helpful. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So I want to talk about biodiversity credits. So we are a season. There's been a big market now for climate credits, and some of them are good, and some of them are bad. And there are actually climate credits that can destroy biodiversity. For example, you can grant, plant a fast-growing eucalyptus farm that can absorb a lot of carbon, but can actually destroy a lot of biodiversity. Um, so I wanted to know what are you seeing in the biodiversity credit world, and what do you like, and what are you afraid of? So we have not had a project that's that's tapped that yet. It's a very nascent market. Um, the the climate market is um, is definitely more mature. Um, you know, I'm sure <laughs> folks saw the uh, the um, oh John Oliver uh, critique of of carbon credits. Um, definitely worth checking out. Um, you know, I was just down in in Chile and we were talking with um, somebody who's trying to get a bio or a, sorry, a carbon credit um, scheme up and running there and was talking about parceling off a, an area and only 2% of the lands would be developed. Well, 2% of a hectare is kind of big and that might be fine if you leave the forest, you know, have your house, leave the forest around it from a climate perspective. But what does that do to biodiversity when you have houses, you have you know, places where that were previously wild that now have a house and a barn and, you know, a dog. And, <laughs> and everything, dogs, yeah, and cats. Um, so I think a lot of what concerns me about the whole idea of a biodiversity credit is the same things that concern me about a, the carbon credit market of gaming the system, essentially. To me, mm -hmm. that's a gaming of the system um, for, for, the, for, for, for climate, for carbon. Um, so I, I worry that, for instance, um, you'll do a, a massive rewilding project in order to get biodiversity credits, but that actual rewilding isn't sustainable for a whole host of reasons. It could be it could actually be resulting because of climate. So you sort of artificially pump your numbers of mm -hmm. biodiversity to get your credits, sell them, and it's not sustainable over the long term. Um, those are the kinds of things that I think are concerning. Um, you know, that said, I don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think we should definitely look at opportunities. To, anything that brings more finance into biodiversity conservation is something we shouldn't just throw away out of hand. Right. And let's just talk a little bit about biodiversity itself. I uh, heard recently that 75% of the insects of the world have disappeared in the, la in the last century. Um, it's yeah, there is, um, I think, and I think Don has the link. There's a fantastic article today in the Guardian's Age of Extinction um, mm -hmm. series, which we helped to launch um, back in 2018. Mm -hmm. um, and the statistics are, that are on there, are they're depressing. 96% um, of the total mammal biomass on Earth is humans and our livestock. 70% um, of all birds on Earth are domestic poultry. I mean, when you think about these numbers, you know, 50% um, of the world's terrestrial wildlife has disappeared since 1970. Um, you know, the background extinction rate, rate is a thousand times higher than what it has been in, in history, the background rate, higher, a thousand times higher than the background rate. Um, you probably remember a few, <laughs> a few years ago, there was an article that came out saying there's 3 billion less birds in North America than there were in 1970. I mean, the statistics go on and on and on. But, the way you referenced was the insect apocalypse. Um, the state of biodiversity isn't great. And, you know, it, it would only be the arrogance of humans to think that that doesn't matter, that the fact that there's fewer critters around doesn't matter because we'll just engineer our way out of it. Same, same idea, you know, with climate that we'll just engineer our way out of it. The reality is the earth, we're the ones who broke the earth <laughs> and it's on right, us, exactly. our responsibility to kind of put Humpty Tumpty back together again. 
um, something around 75% of the earth is showing and 75% of the earth and 66% of the ocean is showing um, the impacts of humanity. Right. That, that, I would think 100% is, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we have to we have to save what's left. That's the cheapest, best way to save biodiversity. And we don't even we sort of were talking about it earlier. We don't necessarily always appreciate the benefits that are flowing from nature to us because we, we don't put a dollar figure on. It. Um, you know, it's so much cheaper. You live in New, in New York and um, one of the best things that New York City ever did was to protect the Adirondacks. Exactly. Because by protecting the Adirondacks, they protected their water system and it has saved billions of dollars for New York City to have clean water coming to them as opposed to having to treat that water. This is just one example. Um, and so, you know, I, I often say that I don't think that a protected area protects or that a protected area is the 100% solution for any single problem, but it's probably the 90% solution for like 100 <laughs> yeah. right? It's, it's safe. By the way, it helps with biodiversity. Probably... Yeah, it helps with biodiversity. It, you know, provides places for us to all recreate, provides clean water, clean air, um, all of those, all of the benefits that flow from there, um, we, we benefit from. And I want to end with just looking at your pictures made me feel good. I mean, I, I, you know, put myself into those landscapes. I got to go to those mountains in Georgia. I mean, oh, they're spectacular. There's something spiritual. There's something healing. There's something actually that returns us to more of our essential humanity by being in these spaces. And so there are a lot of incredibly important and needy issues that we all need to do, but there is you know, that we all need to support and work towards and something. But in some ways, what this work is really about is getting out of the way and letting the earth, letting nature be nature. Exactly. I mean, when I returned from Iraq, the first thing we did, it was the first week and back, you would think we'd all be out partying and whatever, we were young people, we were 27 years old, 26 years old. But instead, myself and all of the, my fellow officers hiked up Pikes Peak in Colorado Springs um, because it, it, there was something about nature healing, um, you know, but it was way before that was like a thing. Um, but we you right. know, understood exactly. that. And um, I think that's, you know, one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this work is because I've benefited personally from wild, wild places. Mm. Well, we are so grateful for your work and for Hans Borg's work and his vision and we really hope that the uh, COP15 conference that starts tonight is going to lay out some serious aspirations and that all the world is going to live up to them. Indeed. Well, I've been so grateful for you taking us on this tour through the, the positive story. I mean, by the way, I know it's not a lot, but it is, but come on, 100,000 acres is kind of amazing. It's just kind of amazing. And I hope that through this, seminar there's another person out there goes i'm going to protect 100,000 acres too <laughs> i mean it's it's fantastic and we know that you're going to do so much more um thank you this has really been so wonderful for this conversation <laughs> audience thank you for joining in this work. uh just a reminder our forums are offered free of charge some of you had donated we love you for that if you'd like to support our programming consider going to the www.garrisoninstitute.org um, uh, website and click donate button and uh, you can become a sponsor. And our next Pathway to Planetary Health Forum will be in January, I think January 25th, with guest Xu Wing Wangchuk of the Bhutan Foundation. So Bhutan is one of the countries that just uh, in its constitution protects over two thirds of its forests and is deeply committed to biological and forest preservation. It's the, uh, it's a country, it's one of the few countries that is entirely climate positive. They make all their electricity only from uh, hydropower. Uh, so there's lots of exciting things where we can take this story to its next level. Um, so please join us for that discussion and uh, join our, look at our website for a full listing of upcoming programs. Thank you so much, Heath. This is really, really delightful. Thanks for having me.